Greetings. Welcome to the SPC Daily Word for Tuesday, April 27th, 2021. It seems as though spring is finally here in Northern Illinois. It's a little windy when I'm recording this, but the high is supposed to be in the 70s and we're getting going with baseball practice. And now is one of those times weather-wise where we're thankful to live in the Northern Midwest. We're also thankful to be looking at 2 Peter chapter two. We're gonna finish uh, chapter two by looking at verses 17 to 22. Again, just a little bit of review. This is a farewell letter. Peter believes he is going to be dying very soon. And there have been some false teachers who have wormed their way in to Peter's congregation. And he wants to leave them with some very, very vital instructions that he believes will serve them well after he has died. I'm convinced that especially here in this second chapter, one of the things that Peter is doing is he is obeying the final commands he received from the Lord Jesus. If you look in John chapter 21, after this famous um, exhortation where Jesus says to Peter, who, if you remember, has just denied him at his death, there's the questions, do you love me and then feed my lambs? Do you love me, tend my sheep? Do you love me? And he said to him, I'm in verse uh, 17, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. These words tend to ring in the apostles' ears that he has been given an, an instruction by the risen and ascended Christ that he must feed Jesus' sheep. Sunday of this past week was, or Sunday of this week, was Good Shepherd Sunday. The text was John 10. The psalm was Psalm 23, where Jesus is described as the Good Shepherd who gathers these sheep. Well, as Jesus ascends after his resurrection, he then leaves a charge to Peter and those whom Peter will train that they must feed the sheep Jesus has gathered. So that's why he takes so seriously this injunction against these false teachers. So I'm in verse 17 of 2 Peter chapter 2. These are, speaking of these false teachers, waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the deepest darkness has been reserved. For they speak bombastic nonsense and with licentious desires of the flesh, they entice people who have just escaped from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption, for people are slaves to whatever masters them. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them, the defilements of the world, and overpowered. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it, would have ha for it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment that was passed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, the dog turns back to its own vomit and the sow is washed only to wallow in the mud. So as he concludes, um, his warnings about these false teachers, he basically has two things that he wants um, to remind us of. Um, the first is this, what the false teachers are feeding you will not satisfy. He uses an image there of verse 17 of imagine we're in a drought, okay? And these clouds or this mist comes and we're expecting the drought to be over with rain, but then the wind blows the clouds away and here we are left drier than we ever would before. So in verses 17 to 19, he wants to emphasize that these false teachers and what they're feeding will never satisfy the church. Their words are empty, but their words also have, in verses 18 and 19, a certain type of, of fruit they bear. Notice verse 17. For they speak bombastic nonsense 
And we see that and we think, okay, Peter, why are you warning us so significantly about these false teachers? Because you seem to be saying that we're going to be able to pick them out of a crowd. Well, given what he then describes, you realize that their words entice people. They speak this nonsense because they have these licentious desires of the flesh. And then with these words, they entice people who have just escaped from those who live in error. So the temptation is going to be for these young believers to then be enticed back into what Jesus had saved them from. So the fruit of these false teachers the fruit of these empty words is first it is a fruit that is attractive just like the fruit that the serpent offered eve and adam was attractive so these false teachers have fruit that is attractive but it is a fruit that will create bondage so ultimately true teaching is going to be teaching that in jesus sets us free doesn't create a new type of slavery so the first thing the false teachers and what they are feeding you it will not satisfy secondly in verses 20 to 20 what the false teachers are feeding you will destroy you now notice how peter describes these young believers and their conversion for if they're at for if after they have escaped the defilements of the world that goes back to the introduction of how the gospel sets us free from what the world traps us with and how have they escaped that through the knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ that ultimately what these false teachers are going to do is pull us away from jesus and what peter in this passage is zealous to teach us is that it is the knowledge of jesus that delivered us from the world and it is also the knowledge of jesus that sustains us notice verse 20 how strong this is just like jesus says in the synoptic gospels for some people it would have been better for them never to have been born in a similar way verse 21 of second peter 2 for it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness that ultimately this knowledge of Jesus is designed to move us in the path of righteousness. So again, one of the things that this moment that we are in requires us to consider is one, quote unquote, Christian religious teaching is so available to us. How can we evaluate that teaching? This image here of, of food is something that is helpful here because a lot of us are kind of drawn to the smorgasbord approach to Christian teaching. I had a meeting with a pastor friend of mine and he described on Sunday he had lunch with his wife and with his son and his son's family and their church is in DeKalb and he described that finally my favorite Chinese buffet is open again. And this is a Chinese buffet, which in and of itself is good enough because I love within the Chinese buffet going and getting the fried rice, going and getting the chicken, going and getting the soy sauce, going and getting um, uh, General So's chicken, getting Kung Pao chicken, getting sweet and sour, and then getting uh, some of the sweet and sour sauce. I love that this one in DeKalb has a hibachi grill where you can give the meat and, and the, the rice or the noodles and the vegetables that you want. And then you give them an egg to crack over it to mix it all up. And then I love adding the soy sauce to that. This one also has a sushi bar to it. And I'm just thinking about how wonderful it will be. I'm not sure that I would be comfortable yet going to a Chinese buffet. Um, just because they say buffets are particularly prone to spreading the virus. Yet, oh, it made me so hungry. Even though it was nine o'clock in the morning, I was wanting lunch at the Chinese buffet in DeKalb. And what's great about a place like a Chinese buffet is you can go and get a little bit of this, and then a little bit of this, and then a little bit of this, and a little bit of this, and then eat all that up and then go get another plate and get a little bit of this and a little bit of this and a little bit of this. And there's just this plethora of different choices 
And then that essential ingredient to a good Chinese buffet is some soft serve ice cream to chase it all down with so that then when you're riding home, you can fall asleep, hopefully if you're not driving. Beloved, Chinese buffets are wonderful. They have a time and a place, but beloved, I am not going to live very long if I constantly feed myself with the many, many choices at a buffet. Beloved, ultimately, God's design for faithful Christian teaching is for you and I to be a part of a community where Jesus by the Spirit has gifted certain leaders that I know very, very well, whose lifestyle I can seek to imitate as they imitate Jesus, I can imitate them. And then to regularly expose myself to their teaching and then simply be a family together. Beloved, ultimately, Jesus' plan for us is not to sustain our lives with a little bit of this and a little bit of this and this teaching and this preaching and this ministry and this on the radio and this on YouTube and then this podcast. There's a time and a place for those things. But ultimately, a healthy diet of Christian teaching. The pastors and preachers who influence us the most should be the ones who preach and teach in the local congregation in which we are participating in baptism, the Lord's Supper, and being a family together. Beloved, do your teachers create righteousness in you that 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 resembles what he describes as far as virtue in chapter one verses five to seven self-control sibling love does that freedom to love others that freedom to not be enslaved to your own appetites does that come from the teaching you receive do the teachers you hear from point you to a greater knowledge of, and I'm not going to say a greater knowledge of the Bible, although that's a good thing, but ultimately, do they point you to a greater knowledge of Jesus? Is their use of the scriptures something that by the Spirit, your knowledge of Jesus increases? Beloved, do the teachers in your life come from meals with Jesus. I gather that from the text that we began with, John 21. The command in John 21 verse 12 to Peter is to come have breakfast. So then after having breakfast with Jesus, Peter then moves in the direction of love. So do the teachers in your life come from their own meals with Jesus? And then do they come to us for the love of Jesus? Jesus wants to make sure that that love is the foundation upon which Peter will or from which Peter will feed his sheep. And then finally, do the teachers in your life come to you with what Jesus has fed them with? Beloved Peter, at the end of his life, is zealous to know that after he is dead and gone, those whom he has fed will continue to be fed that which will help them flourish. May we be teachers who fulfill that desire that Peter had, and then may we also be recipients of teaching that is faithful to pointing people to a greater knowledge of Jesus. Thank you so much for joining me. May grace, peace, and everything good be yours.